Thank you, Shauna. Bartimaeus, a great, great story. This short narrative of Bartimaeus we can actually consider as an opportunity for self-reflection. As we often say, there are endless sermons, messages, or takeaways from Scripture, no matter how many times we read them, we preach them, we study them, there's always something new when we read the Word. Most of us have heard of Socrates, who lived 300 years before Jesus. I didn't know that, actually, but 300 years before Jesus. Whether Jesus knew of him, I think he probably did. I don't know. Jesus was known for being an expert in the, for our teachers out there, the Socratic method of teaching. Socratic method of teaching. So what is that? What is that? Jesus asked questions of his disciples, his listeners, probing personal and provocative questions. They were questions designed to make a listener go, hmm, I have to think about that. Questions that make us go really deep. And when we think of the great teachers in the classroom today, yes, there are the lectures and they can last three hours, but often we're given a question and go away in a group, and we learn so much in that environment. Because questions open up conversations, whatever the forum is, and we learn from discussions. It also opens doors to difficult conversations that we would rather not have, but we need to have. So the question Jesus asked is a challenge to consider some of Jesus' most important questions found in the Gospels. Today, a question about desires. A modern parable, and I know Bob is our storyteller, but I found one today. John Eldridge, in his book, The Journey of Desire. And I'll read that for you. Once upon a time, there lived a sea lion who had lost the sea. And he lived in a country known as the Barren Lands. And high on a plateau far away from any coast, it was a place so dry and dusty that it be, could be called a desert. A kind of coarse grass grew in patches here and there, and a few trees were scattered across the horizon. But mostly it was dust, and sometimes wind, which together make one very thirsty. Of course, it must seem strange to you that such a beautiful creature should wind up in a desert at all. He was, mind you, a sea lion. But things like this do happen. I don't know about that, but this fellow did. How the sea lion came to the barren lands, no one could remember. It all seemed so very long ago. So long, in fact, it appeared as though he had always been there. Not that he belonged in such an arid place, how could that be? He was, after all, a sea lion. But as you know, once you've lived so long in a certain spot, no matter how odd, you come to think of it as home. The secret that begins to solve the riddle of our lives is simply this. We are the sea lion who lost the sea. Life, as usual, is not the life we truly want. It's not the life we truly need. It's not the life we were made for. And this was true of Bartimaeus. So Jesus' question, what do you want me to do for you? May be one of the most important questions that could ever be asked. And of course, it was asked by Jesus. So it's a very important question. Very important. And Frederick Buchner offer, offers a series of questions to help us focus on things that really matter, even if we'd rather not face them. And he had many questions, and I thought <laughs> it was too much for a Sunday morning, so I just took a couple. And he asked this, of all the things you have done in your life, which is the one you would like to undo? Boy, that's a deep one. I think I have a novel for that. Which is the one that makes you happiest to remember? And here's the big one. If this were the last day of your life, what would you do with it? Yeah, that's a deep question. So how do those questions fit into this whole story of Bartimaeus? 
Jesus was going to, to, to Jerusalem to die. He was on his way to his death. And he knew it. He tries to tell his disciples, but they just don't understand. And a Russian novelist writes about a similar experience that changed his life. As a young man, he was arrested for belonging to a group of radicals who were considered treasonous against Tsar Nicholas I. And they were condemned to death by a firing squad. Now, as it turns out, it was just a cruel joke. It's a terrible joke. The guns were loaded with blanks. And by the way, I hate to tell you this, but that still goes on today in the world. And it's awful way of obtaining information and so on. So they were blanks in this. The novelist describes it this way. He wakes up in the morning of his execution. And as he ate his last meal, he savored every bite. And on the way to the firing squad, he breathed in the precious air and he studied every face with intensity. He felt the sun beating down on him and he appreciated its warmth as he's never known before. Everything around him took on a magical quality. He was seeing the world as he had never seen it before. All his senses were heightened. He was fully alive. So here's the connection. Could it be that this is how Jesus felt? Maybe he felt this way regularly. He knew his mission. He knew the end. Certainly he felt the sting as he passed through Jericho on this day and he turned his face towards Jerusalem, 15 miles away. He knew he was headed there to die. And it's interesting that I'm with those who are at end of life and I watch every word as it said that those who seem right at the end hear everything, even though they're unresponsive. Maybe they have that height sense of awareness that we don't have and that they sense. And I can also say, I've observed some divine happenings for those Christians about to cross over. I have often thought, what is going on in this room that I cannot see? It must be wonderful. So Jesus would need heightened senses as we can easily read this passage without considering the context and the cultural element in play. This is Passover. Jesus wasn't on a leisurely stroll with his disciples. The healing of the blind beggar Bartimaeus is significant because it is the final healing that Mark reports. And it enters as an interruption into the events of Jesus. It's an interruption of Jesus' passion. So Mark sets the scene with Jesus leaving Jericho on the last leg of his journey to Jerusalem. Passover is approaching, and the road is jammed with pilgrims chanting on the way to the holy city. It's a party. And along the road is another crowd. Parade watchers, curiosity seekers, and those who are too poor, those considered too sinful, if that's possible, too unwell to make the journey to Jerusalem. By now, the size of the crowd following after Jesus was swelled to a great multitude. It is a festival atmosphere and must have filled the air with triumph. The news that the young rabbi who has challenged the religious establishment of the Jews is on his way to Jerusalem, and that would create all kinds of excitement. The promise of a confrontation always draws a crowd, sadly. And isn't it amazing how even today, rebellions, conflict, chaos, brings people out of their regular day or on televisions, they put on their smartphones, turn on their televisions, they have to see. So despite all the noise our Lord hears, he hears this, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And this is loud, this is busy. So on the journey there, there is this interruption. This blind, marginalized man named Bartimaeus began to shout, Jesus, son of David. Have mercy on me. Jesus, likely on full alert, had no trouble picking that voice out of the crowd. It has been said, perhaps, what caught his attention was that this was the first time anyone publicly referred to Jesus as the son of David. The first time. Son of David was a common title for the Messiah, and everybody knew that. 
So blind Bartimaeus was the first to declare publicly his belief that Jesus was indeed the savior of the world, the Messiah, but he was very loud and disturbing to other people. The blind man's faith allowed him to see something that no one else in the crowd could see. And perhaps the most important thing to remember here and when we pray is to who we are praying to or whom we are praying to. Jesus is the Messiah. He's the savior of the world. And the prayers are heard, everyone, not because he must, but because he loves you so much. He desires that intera interaction and relationship with you. He hears them. So then comes the rebuke. In this narrative, we read a rebuke. Those around Jesus rebuked the man for his rude interruption. The culture of the day saw Bartimaeus as out of order. It violated the Jewish rules of decorum. It's very court-like as, as we use word, this word as in a courtroom quite often, or in Robert's rules, depending on the, the situation. This man was considered a sinner and unclean because of his blindness, presumed the punishment for some unspeakable sin. That's why he was blind, that's what they thought. And the only real purpose he served in the current, in the current religious system was to make the so-called proper lofty religious folks feel good about themselves when they threw him a coin. So in studying this passage, we don't know if it was Jesus' disciples who rebuked the man or somebody else, or someone else. But we do know that they had done this sort of thing before, our dear disciples. Not being hard on them today, but it is some truth. <laughs> All truth, actually. Mark 10, 13. People were bringing little children to Jesus to have him touch them. But the disciples rebuked them. On both occasions, Jesus righteously rebukes the rebukers by using the moment as an example of Christian character. This would be a Jesus response as we follow on with our recent messages. So on this occasion with Bartimaeus, Jesus said, call him. And with the children, we know this one, Jesus said, let the little children come to me. I tell you the truth, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. And what do you think that means? Does it mean come with innocence and purity? What is it like to be around children, our children, our grandchildren, youth in general? Well, in fact, this blind man was behaving very, very much like a little child when being ignored. And there's a real need here, a real need. And this adult, who's maybe acting like a little child, has a need and he wants to be heard. So when Bartimaeus was rebuked, he shouted even louder, Son of David, have mercy on me. Now, I've experienced this recently, avoiding a specific issue in my life. Mine is a little more complicated than this one, I think. But humility played a role in that, the event in my life. So perhaps being childlike just means being humble enough to ask for help when you need it and to try something even when you can't do it well. Pride keeps us far away from the blessings of God. And I do clarify though, encouragement is a must for everyone, including your church family. This doesn't necessarily mean stoking the person's pride. We all need authentic encouragement, particularly as a church family. So the question, Jesus asked the man, what do you want me to do for you? What a question. It reveals God's servant heart for humanity, especially in our brokenness, poverty, and blindness. Jesus said he came not to be served, but to serve. With this question, we see once again how serious he is. What would you ask for? We too are poor blind, and we're spiritually marginalized. We too need to come before God in our brokenness, our helplessness, our blindness, and our poverty. We too need to call out to Christ to take pity on us. 
And if we dare renounce our egos and selfishness or self selfishness and beg for God's help, we too will hear God ask, what do you want me to do for you? You see, Jesus had asked this question before. Mark 10, 35, and the verses, verses just before Jesus' encounter with Bartimaeus, James and John came to Jesus and said, teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. Remember that? And Jesus responded, what do you want me to do for you? Their answer, let one of us sit on your right and the other on your left in your glory. Guess what? They didn't get what they wanted. And why? Because they didn't ask in faith. They asked in ambition. An excellent quote from some of the commentaries says this, faith asks for what it needs. Ambition asks for what it wants. So the response, the blind man responded in faith. Rabbi, I want to see. That was a need. That was a real need. The problem we might have, we don't know when we're blind. So maybe we're asking for the wrong things. Or worse yet, we ask for nothing at all. That's a tragedy. Let's consider a passage demonstrating the battle Jesus constantly encountered between religious hypocrisy with the religious leaders of the day. John 9, 39 to 41, Jesus said, for judgment I have come into this world so that the blind will see and those who see will become blind. Some Pharisees who were with him heard him say this and asked, what, are we blind too? And Jesus said, if you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin. But now that you claim you can see, your guilt remains. Jesus is saying, we become blind when we think we can do it all on our own and we have it all together. When in this frame of mind or spiritual state, in our pride, we never really call out to Jesus for help because sometimes we cannot humble ourselves enough to overcome that pride factor. This was the battle Jesus had in dealing with the Pharisees. And certainly we can apply this issue to all humanity and to all of us, I think, in some way. So concluding, Bartimaeus' simple childlike question Opened him to all the opened him up to all the possibilities of God's power, and Jesus said his childlike faith has healed him. Immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus all along the road. Imagine the joy. He was seeing everything for the first time, because his faith was selfless without pride. His marginalized life formed him into this giant of the faith. So may all of us move beyond fear, beyond pride, and beyond doubt as we come to Jesus like a little child and with faith. We do this by bringing down the walls and lay before him our sin, our suffering, and our brokenness. The Lord bless you, church. Faith is simple if we become like children. Amen.